Good morning and welcome to Sunday morning Bible class from Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kitchener, Ontario. It's uh, good to have you with us, uh, whether you are uh, following us in real time as part of the live stream this morning or whether you're tuning in a little bit later in the week as we continue our journey through the Old Testament book of Esther, the only book of the Bible that does not make any overt reference to God, to prayer, to any other, any number of other things that um, are kind of, you know, part of just about every other book of the Bible. Uh, but nonetheless, a book where God is very, very much at work, and we're going to get right into that here uh, this morning as we uh, uh, unpack uh, in due time Esther chapter 4. Now, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping, as we typically do here at the, the beginning of Bible class. Uh, if you are uh, watching at home and you want to download uh, the lesson sheet uh, for this morning, that's available at uh, the church website, and uh, you can go there now, and you will see uh, the, the uh, button for downloading uh, the, the class notes. It's right under the button for live streaming. And I'll say right off the bat here this morning that uh, this is one of the, those classes where I really regret that we are not able to have a larger group of people here in the building uh, because there are certain points of uh, the class today that really, I think, uh, lend themselves very well to some group uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, because we're so severely restricted in terms of the numbers of people we can have uh, in the building, that's, uh, that's not possible. So if you have any questions, and I'll take a little bit more time than usual today, uh, or, or ideas come up in your mind as we talk about uh, uh, some of the things that are in the, the material for today, please, 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 please feel free to shoot me an email. And I have my phone here with me, and uh, we will uh, check the emails pretty regularly to see uh, if there's any uh, comments that have uh, come to us and uh, try to respond to those as best we can. Now, I know that uh, some of you are just getting that uh, second cup of coffee, getting yourselves comfortable and trying to get yourselves organized uh, to go into Bible class mode here this morning. So uh, to give you just a moment to uh, do that, I've uh, curated again this week a number of slides that uh, caught me uh, uh, and, and that I thought were kind of funny. Uh, you may or may not uh, think they are, but we'll continue a little series that we began a couple of weeks ago. Um, on uh, the new levels of stupidity uh, that are reached each and every week as we go through uh, this time of pandemic. Someone somewhere has developed a mask uh, that <laughs> simply covers your nose so that you can eat in public. Um, that's just <laughs> tremendous. I, uh, I have no idea why you would want to do that. Oh, my little magic pen isn't working this morning. Oh, well. Um, another uh, thing that's always a fascination for me is signs that don't exactly communicate as clearly as people might want them to communicate. I, I think I know what they were trying to say here, um, but uh, it certainly is certainly open to some speculation. People eating... Oops, what's going on here? Why is this? Okay, I wanted this a pen. There we go. People are eating children in this area. Well, that's not what they meant to say. But anyway, so uh, at any rate, uh, leash up your dog and clean up after them. All right. And um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, like uh, a lot of folks here in Ontario, I took my car in uh, to get the uh, winter tires taken off, get an oil change done. And uh, <clears throat> I was informed uh, there's a whole new way of doing oil changes uh, now that uh, the best way to get all that oil out is to uh, give the car a good firm squeeze, and then all the oil comes out of the car. Uh, no, not, not saying that's the best uh, for the car. There, my pen's working again. Very good. All right, and then finally, and this is my personal favorite of all of the uh, images that I've uh, culled through this week. You might wonder, do I actually do any work? Yes, I do. Um, but anyway, um, 
Uh, this is, next one is more of a public service announcement um, in the sense that uh, next weekend is Victoria Day, which is a holiday weekend here, and then hot on the heels of Victoria Day sometime in June, I have no idea which date it is, but I know it's coming, is Father's Day. And people want to always shop uh, something nice for dad. And I think I found a very bargain level item that will be one of the most unique gifts any father could receive uh, this year. Uh, some pants. Um, uh, let's see here. And, and I don't know that you can really see this on the screen, but uh, I need to slip my glasses off so I can actually read it here. Patterns galore and colors aplenty. Yes, siree. For $14.95 somewhere back in the day, you could buy double knit pants uh, for Trill, and you could also get some of these really special shoes that go with it too. And some of us... <laughs> Some of us in the building this morning are old enough to remember when that ad was, uh, well, something, well, well, maybe we should look at getting that. But um, as you can see by looking at me in the lower corner of the screen and looking at this guy, there are certain differences between us then and now. And uh, I'm not sure <laughs> that... Mind you, some people may still have this stuff in their closet because the one good thing about Fortrell and Double Knit Pants is they never, ever, ever wore out. You couldn't kill those things. Anyway, all right, that's a little fun for this morning. Let's get into the story of Esther as we... Uh, we're going to pick up a few loose ends, first of all, from last week. Here's the uh, website information again and the email address if you missed it the first time. And uh, now into uh, what we talked about last time. Just to give you a really quick summary, a uh, two-minute uh, uh, summary of, of the material uh, from last time. Uh, you may recall we began near the end of chapter 2, where Mordecai, who is Esther's cousin and guardian, uh, uncovers a plot against King Xerxes, uh, manages to get word to Esther uh, who gets word to the king, who takes the appropriate action for that time and executes the would-be executors and uh, survives that uh, moment of, of nervousness and fear. And then the story took a rather unexpected turn in uh, Esther chapter 3, where the king uh, decides to honor a man named Haman, and uh, Haman is the, the uh, to use the, the term I learned back in uh, high school English, he's the antagonist in this story. He is the enemy. He's the bad guy. And uh, he is honored by the king. And uh, uh, we're not sure why he's honored. We're not sure whether he's honored instead of Mordecai or whether there's no relationship really at all between the two things that... Uh, have happened here, and uh, at any rate, he's honored. But that causes a, a question of conscience uh, for Mordecai. Uh, because Mordecai is Jewish, and because Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites, because Haman is, uh, 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 follows other gods, uh, we're not exactly sure all of why it happens, but what happens is that Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman, refuses to acknowledge him as being the one that the king has elevated to this new level of, of being second in charge of the kingdom. And Haman is, of course, offended at that. And uh, he seeks, then, to not only destroy Mordecai, but also to destroy all of the Jewish people. He knows that Mordecai is a Jew and uh, that there are many Jews throughout the empire. Why? Because they've been brought there during the time of the Babylonian captivity. They had been sent home or many had been allowed to return home uh, decades before, but um, there, there's still a large number of Jews who have lived their entire life in the kingdom and are quite happy to remain there, uh, perhaps were born there, and they've made their whole life there, and they're not motivated to go back uh, to Judea again and begin life all over. And so there are hundreds of thousands of Jews, at, at very least, and um, he unleashes a plot 
to have them uh, exterminated. And he selects the day by casting lots. It will be a day 11, uh, nearly 12 months into the future. Uh, he goes and he gets the blessing of the king to take uh, this action. And then the edict is issued. And then we are given this um, summary statement uh, at the end of chapter 3 uh, that the king and Haman sat down to drink but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. And then where we took the discussion last week, and we'll just spend a couple quick minutes uh, uh, going over a few thoughts that uh, came from last time, is is how, sadly, uh, this was not the first and certainly not the last attempt in the history of the world to wipe out uh, the Jewish populations in, in certain areas and uh, we, we talked openly uh, last week about how Luther himself uh, had some rather unsavory ideas and, and downright hateful ideas about Jewish people. And uh, a number of you um, dialogued with me during the week about that, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. As the week went on, a few more emails came, and uh, uh, I hope that discussion was helpful. Like I say, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, we, 500 years later, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we um, understand that, uh, you know, not everything Luther said uh, was, was specifically, uh, you know, uh, the, the Christian thing to say? And uh, someone even asked the question, you know, uh, if Luther had lived today, would he have been canceled for some of this? Um, and I, I, I had to think about that a little bit because uh, uh, that is the way sometimes today, unfortunately, I think that we handle people who have views that are not really part of the, you know, where, where society wants to go. And in, in, in some instances, it's certainly good that we distance ourselves from uh, individuals whose actions or uh, words do not uh, reflect, uh, you know, basic Christian standards of behavior or belief. Um, but uh, Luther um, uh, didn't live in that kind of time, and I always think it's important that uh, as we look at historic figures, we judge them not so much by the time we live in today and the sensitivities we have today, uh, but by the world in which they lived. And uh, one of the realities of the world in which Luther lived was that as odious and disgusting as his ideas were about Jewish people, um, he was certainly not the only one to have them. And uh, we're better, I think, to say, yeah, he said this stuff, own it. Um, But then also to be very clear that this is not what we as Lutherans particularly uh, believe, uh, that he was not inerrant, he was not 100% infallible and divinely inspired in everything that he said. He uncovered the gospel, that was his gift to the church, and, uh, and that he, like all the rest of us, had parts of him that uh, were not quite as uh, easy to look at and uh, easy to accept, and uh, that we acknowledge that too, that he was a sinful man, and uh, some of that sinfulness in him uh, was an extreme bias against, uh, in, in this case, Jewish people. He had the same bias against other people as well. Uh, he wrote uh, some, some hymns that uh, we, we've brought over into English and had to clean up the words considerably uh, because what you could sing in a hymn 500 years ago about uh, the murdering Pope and Turk uh, uh, aren't things that we probably should be singing about in in church today. Uh, You know, he was a man of his time, and to to judge him by his own time and not by our time, and to take some of these things that he wrote that are unsavory and unpleasant, and to certainly use them in ways that, uh, um, to try and use that to prevent us from making uh, similar kinds of errors because, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the history does repeat itself. People do get strange ideas and people do uh, uh, say uh, all kinds of horrible things about other people. Let's take a quick look here and see. No, we haven't gotten any controversy yet. The other uh, way I wanted to take this, and we'll just talk this very, very briefly here this morning because I do want to get into Esther chapter 4, is that... Um, and this was on the lesson sheet uh, for last time, 
is that uh, Christians too uh, have to endure persecution uh, in this world. It's a uh, it's, uh, reality that has been around as basically as long as uh, Christ, uh, ever since Christ came into the world, beginning with the uh, murder uh, arranged by Herod of the innocent children of Bethlehem, uh, followers of Christ have had to endure waves and waves of persecution. And uh, like the people of Israel, in, uh, the Jewish people in Esther, we, you know, much of that is, we would believe, unjust, unfair. It's just singling Christian people out because of their confession and no other reason. And to the point that uh, you know, some 260 million Christians today uh, live uh, in nations, and there are about 50 of them in the world, that are... Uh, very much into persecuting Christians uh, for what they believe. And uh, these 260 million, which you, you stop and think about it for a minute, that's uh, several times the population of Canada, uh, that these people are enduring persecution on a daily basis uh, for what they believe, or are at least open to being persecuted. And some of the top countries in the world for that are places like North Korea, Afghanistan. Um, there's quite a long list, actually, of places uh, where Christians are persecuted, and even includes some countries that are nominally at least uh, Christian. I was surprised, for example, to see um, Ethiopia, uh, a country that I've been to, a country where uh, on just about every street corner you'll find uh, an Orthodox Coptic church. But it's also on that list of top 50 countries for persecuting Christians. Why? Because sometimes it's the other Christians who don't belong to that church who find themselves under the oppression of the government, uh, a kind of a strange and bizarre uh, situation. And then in, on your screen, I've... I've uh, included a picture of a, a colleague uh, of ours, a man I've met a couple of times from Finland. Uh, he is uh, Johanna Palula. He is the incoming bishop of what they call the Mission Province of Finland. And uh, this man is a, a, a conservative Lutheran, a very evangelical, loving, caring man who's a, a scholar and uh, done some wonderful writing. Uh, he himself, just in recent weeks, has been charged uh, with um, uh, publishing hate literature because of a pamphlet that he wrote back in 2004, or at least he was among the group of people who wrote it, uh, in Finland uh, that was uh, arguing for uh, continuing to define marriage as uh, the union of one man, one woman, uh, for life, the traditional biblical understanding of marriage. And uh, now in 2021, uh, many years later, he and the other authors have all been charged with uh, disseminating hate literature. The ironic thing about all of this is that Finland itself did not change its own marriage laws until just five years ago in 2017. But now what they have done is they've kind of retroactively gone back to, to a document written, you know, 13 years before that and said, well, that's now hate literature and uh, are charging the authors uh, with writing it. Now, uh, no one knows exactly how this case is going to go, but uh, we are all watching it uh, rather closely because it just doesn't seem uh, on the surface to be fundamentally uh, just or correct uh, to publish, uh, to charge someone for writing something 13 years ago, uh, at any rate, it just, just, just doesn't make any sense. But that, you know, in, a, in the world today, uh, uh, persecution doesn't often make sense. And so, uh, as time goes on, I think, and the, you know, the scriptures are, are clear on this, the church will face more persecution rather than less, and we will join with the martyrs who are under the altar in Revelation chapter 6 and cry out, with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long, O Lord, will you let this persecution or the various persecutions of your people continue? And uh, 
as we journey through this world, we need to always be looking to the cross because it's there on the cross that uh, God took the ultimate persecution. There the utterly innocent one, the one who had committed no sin, who was not a racist, who was not in any way, shape, or form any of the isms that uh, uh, we today uh, define as being wrong. Uh, he took uh, on himself all of that and all of the punishment and persecution uh, for us. He took it upon himself to be with us there and took it upon himself for us. So even when we are attacked, when, when it's our turn to be victimized and to suffer from the evil plots of others, where we wonder what God is doing in it all, we know this, he is working. The cross assures us that God is with us even when we can't feel it. The cross assures us that God's redemptive purposes, God's work of bringing salvation is greater than the evil being done. We read that last week in the gospel reading, Jesus telling his disciples, you'll have trouble in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And as we look in faith um, toward the cross, our hearts are lifted so that instead of being filled with anger, we're filled with grace, hope, and even uh, forgiveness. So that brings uh, to a bit of a close some of the things that we were talking about uh, last time. Just, uh, oh, we, we managed uh, a few questions here. Let's uh, take a moment here and I'll just take a quick read. Um, uh, okay, this is an unrelated question about when did uh, Lutherans uh, begin to be referred to as Lutherans. Um, uh, somewhere in the 1530s, but I'll check and get back to the person with an exact date. They were up to then known as, at first as Protestants. Lutherans are the first uh, uh, Protestants, if you will, because we were protesting. Um, yes, another comment. Could, could some of Luther's opinion be because he tried to convert the Jews and failed? Absolutely, there's a connection there. Uh, early in his ministry, Luther was very uh, big on the... the, the you know, once the Jews heard the gospel, once we got all of the tradition and all the mess out of the way and they got to hear the gospel finally in its purity, they would convert. And when that didn't happen, um, he got mad at them. And, uh, and again, I don't think that's the right response, but it puts it into a context in his own life. Yes, absolutely. All right, back again here. We got one more. We're really going on. Um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Sometimes, as yeah, comment made here, that, you know, as we go through life and we, uh, uh, we, we uh, experience uh, unpleasantness directed at us, uh, it builds our character. And there's a reference to Jordan Peterson, a professor at the U of T. That's also right out of the Bible, uh, you know, from Romans uh, chapter 5, where, you know, uh, you know, suffering builds perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope and hope does not disappoint us. I haven't quoted that exactly. But uh, yeah, even in our sufferings, uh, we know that God is at work. And that's actually a very good uh, segue over into what we're going to talk about uh, now, because uh, that's exactly the sort of thing that begins to happen in Esther chapter 4. So, let us, without further ado, uh, move into the fourth chapter of uh, the book of Esther. So if you haven't uh, got your Bibles out yet, this would be a good moment to find uh, the Bible and uh, open it up, and uh, we will begin. The story begins, uh, chapter 4, uh, with Mordecai. And uh, Mordecai is set here in contrast to what's going on in the palace. If you recall a few moments ago, uh, the king and Haman were sitting down to toast the success of this new plan against the Jews. Uh, the city of Susa is thrown into confusion, and Mordecai himself is mourning and grieving. Let's read the first three verses of chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. 
but he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and the order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Well, this is how people in that time and and still today in some parts of the world express their grief. Uh, We in North America tend to, uh, and, and, and I think Northern Europe tend to, you know, favor the stiff upper lip approach. You don't let anybody really know. You put on a front and uh, kind of keep most of that inside. Uh, not so much in uh, the Middle East, not so much uh, back uh, in the time of, of uh, the Persian Empire. Grieving was loud. Grieving was visible. Uh, grieving involved making some changes, the whole rending of your garments, that this is something that tears at you, uh, a kind of almost identifying uh, with death itself. In this case, um, even though the death hasn't happened, the people are, uh, Mordecai is, 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 is putting himself through a, a kind of a death-like experience or acting out in a certain sense uh, what death is. Uh, and he puts on uh, the garments of mourning and the garments of repentance, the garments of shame, sackcloth and, and uh, ashes, and he and the rest of the people uh, begin to fast. Now, this is a very common Old Testament uh, practice that is uh, linked uh, to times of prayer. And we will see again at the end of the chapter another reference to fasting. And we'll talk about the connection to prayer uh, a little bit more at that time. Uh, but here, I think the reason the author uh, wants to do this is to set this in kind of deliberate contrast to what's been going on in the palace. If you recall, in the early chapters of uh, Esther and again at the end of chapter 3, the palace is this place of festivity and feasting, uh, this place of huge excess of partying and, and th- th- that sort of thing. And then now, as a result of this edict, uh, the palace, uh, you know, outside the palace, there's weeping and mourning. And uh, meanwhile, Haman and uh, Xerxes uh, are uh, enjoying themselves. And this also moves Haman's location. Uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, last time. Haman worked in the building that was called the King's Gate, uh, which was the entrance to the temple. Uh, complex itself, uh, but now he can't go to work there um, uh, because he's dressed in this way. Uh, you didn't dare go to work uh, in the king's palace dressed in, in you know, a gunny sack uh, with ashes uh, on your head. That was not something people wanted to see there. So he has moved now out into the square uh, the central square of the city, uh, just outside the palace. Uh, and he's, uh, that's where he can uh, present his uh, pleas and his concerns. So a little bit removed, uh, further removed from Esther. And we're going to see that um, they're going to need the help of intermediaries to uh, communicate with each other. Uh, Up until this point in time, he's had some access to her, been able to be in contact with her directly. Uh, But now, uh, because of his dress, because he's no longer working in the palace itself, he doesn't have that opportunity. At any rate, uh, Mordecai, uh, that that he is uh, this uh, concerned and consumed with his grieving, um, word of that reaches Esther. Let's read on um, the, the next few uh, verses here. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. 
She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So a number of things happening there. Uh, obviously, Esther is made known of, of uh, the situation uh, with Mordecai, that he's greatly disturbed. He's, he's dressing in, in the sackcloth and ashes out in the, the public square. Uh, her first attempt is to send him some clothes and, uh, and uh, get him dressed up. That he refuses. And, um, and then he explains to her uh, what is about to happen. And uh, kind of the key word here is, uh, is what I read in the NIV uh, as the word annihilation. And uh, that's an absolutely perfect translation uh, uh, of, of the, the Hebrew word uh, that is there. This is a talking about outright, utter wiping out of uh, people on, uh, you know, just totally erasing them uh, from uh, the world stage, if you will. Perhaps the only better word that, that might be used here that, that speaks, you know, in our uh, language that we tend to use would be the word genocide, that it's just everybody who's Jewish um, is, is now going to be uh, cut off and everybody who's Jewish is going uh, to die. And so Esther then uh, responds to Mordecai, and uh, didn't take a lot of time here to put this onto a slide, but we'll just uh, read uh, the story here. I think I must have been in a bit of a hurry yesterday or something when I did this. I uh, kind of didn't put a slide here where we should. Anyway, we won't worry about that. Um, so um, she's been urged to go before the king. Problem is... That's not just something anybody does in that kingdom. Um, you just don't waltz in and talk to the king, uh, even if you're the queen. Uh, you need to be invited, you need to be summoned, and you need to be given explicit permission to talk to the king. So let's read what happens. We're in chapter 4, uh, verses 9 to 11. Hathach went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. She instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception for this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. That kind of explains uh, the, the obstacle she's up against. As I said, nobody but nobody waltzes in to see the king. And nobody, even if you've been invited in to see the king, uh, speaks unless he extends uh, his golden rod in your direction, his scepter, which is giving you then permission to speak uh, to uh, the, the, the king. And unlike today, where, you know, if somebody, um, you know, doesn't, uh, you, you know, there, there was great uh, 
fuss about when you know Donald Trump, for example, went to see Queen Elizabeth and uh, for whatever reasons didn't follow some of the royal protocol. Well, oh, you know th th that got people talking and you know uh, you know made, made all kinds of gossip about that sort of thing and uh, you know some funny jokes on the internet and and that sort of thing and and that's the way we handle that sort of stuff today. If you kind of embarrass yourself or don't follow the protocol, you know you, you'll, you'll suffer the pain of some embarrassment. Not so back in the Persian Empire. Uh, you, you come in there unannounced. Uh, good chance is you're going to be leave, leave missing something like your head. Uh, uh, or if you uh, speak up without being uh, invited to speak, uh, you know, some uh, similar fate uh, befalls you. And so she's got all this you know, kind of uh, rules that need to be followed here. And then this, this kind of last uh, sentence here, 30 days have passed since I was even called to go to the king. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what kind of marriage is that? Um, you know, where they don't even see each other. Uh, for 30 days. Well, that's kind of the way the world was back then. Uh, uh, Xerxes had his, still had his uh, harem. He still, uh, you know, if he didn't want to be with the queen, he didn't have to be with the queen. And uh, he just kind of did whatever pleased him. And uh, if, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it was probably nothing unusual. Uh, some people speculate that maybe their marriage was uh, a little rocky, but uh, as the story goes on, I don't think it is. I think it's just kind of one of those things. They, they, he lived a, a kind of a separate life um, uh, from her. And uh, again, you know, you just kind of, you know, it's maybe not the way we would do things today, but a little more part of the culture and, and uh, uh, style of things back then. All right. This now brings us, and we do have a slide for this, to the moment of truth in the story. Um, and, and Esther... Uh, speaks to, to Mordecai, and Mordecai now responds back. And if, if, if people know anything uh, about, uh, if there's a memory verse, if you will, uh, from the book of Esther that people have hung on to, this is it. Um, uh, uh, we'll read it here in, in just a second. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. All right, he says, you, you don't, you're a little nervous about going before the king, haven't been invited for a while, don't know about that old scepter there. Um, let, me, let me fill you in. Um, uh, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. This is the question that uh, Mordecai uh, brings uh, to, uh, to Esther. And uh, it is for these moments, he believes, that she is able, uh, has, has been elevated to this position. And, and what I find absolutely fascinating here is that is the faith that Mordecai has. The faith that he exhibits in, uh, in Esther or in God, really, uh, and, and ultimately in Esther too. The faith that he has, that God, uh, you know, that, that, that first of all, that relief will come for the Jews. That somewhere, he believes, there is going to be something that uh, will bring uh, relief and, and will, will spare at least some of the Jews. But he realizes that for, for Esther that relief is not likely to come. She's just in far too prominent a place, far too um, uh, visible, and uh, that when her Jewishness is discovered, 
uh, she too will be under the edict and she too will die. So that she's kind of in, uh, you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, she may die if she confronts the king. If she does not confront the king, she absolutely will die. And so it is in that confidence that God is going to do something for the people yet, that there is relief, and that Esther may be the one who can bring that about. He utters this sentence that uh, we uh, take to heart yet today. Who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. We have another question coming in. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, this is a good question. Okay. Um, <laughs> somebody references back, the good, good, good point here, that God is, is clearly working in... Um, in, in the life of Esther and has put her there for this time. Uh, and then going back to how it was that Esther became the queen, um, which, as you recall, involved a, a kind of a one-night audition. And uh, as I said back at the time we covered that, uh, they weren't probably reading poetry uh, to each other. Um, the, the audition was a, probably a fairly carnal uh, sort of thing. And uh, so was it God's will, was it God's plan for Esther to have a one-night stand with the king in order to become queen? Uh, and I'll go back to what I said. Did Esther have a choice in this matter? Um, I'll go back to what I said then, and, and, and uh, I'm going to stick with that answer. Um, and that is that this is yet another example, again, and there are many, many of them, where God uses even sinful actions of people um, uh, to, uh, and works through that. He's greater than sin. And even though you know, this involved a certain tawdriness and seediness and, and uh, yes, disobedience uh, to a command, uh, God is using that. Uh, and, and His power and His grace are bigger than that. Uh, the only other, the, the, another example uh, where God, you know, same kind of situation, uses something that happens to someone uh, or that somebody does, rather, that is sinful to bring about his good purpose. One of, the, one of the best other examples is King David himself in the Old Testament when he has his little affair with Bathsheba. And it's out of that affair with Bathsheba uh, that King Solomon is born. And it is from Solomon that uh, the descendants uh, continue uh, down uh, to Jesus. It is out of that son born out of an adulterous relationship uh, that David ultimately gets called on by the prophet uh, Nathan uh, is, is, shows that it's sin, and, uh, and yet God is at work in that. And this is kind of another one of those examples, I think. And uh, you know, as I said before, a good reminder to us all that, that you know, even though we're not to go out and sin, uh, when we do sin, God is often, you know, He's bigger than that. And He'll take what happened there and uh, he will make often some lesson, some good, something positive happen in our lives if we're open to uh, letting that uh, take place. So good for bringing that up again because, yeah, uh, how she gets to this position, um, no, not exactly how uh, things probably should have happened in strict accordance with God's will. But God uh, uses this in spite of her to uh, bring about his good and gracious will. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's encouragement for us as well. All right. Let's move a little forward here. And this is we've kind of covered this already a little bit. Um, Esther is uh, forced here now to consider if there isn't some unseen hand that is directing uh, the story. Um, 
and, and I think here there's, there's a deliberate contrast, again, just as there was with the fasting and the feasting, a very deliberate contrast here in Mordecai's thinking to the thinking of the empire. Um, and it, in, in, in the empire, uh, you know, to determine the day for the execution of the Jews, lots were cast. Totally a somewhat random process till they got what they were looking for. And, uh, and uh, uh, in, in Esther's case, you know, more this sense that it's not probability, it's not random, it's not by chance that any of this has happened. Uh, there's more to life than the luck of the draw. And uh, it is very much um, part and, and, and parcel of Hebrew thinking to look for God's timing in things. Um, uh, the, 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 the general Hebrew word for time is a very simple word, eth. It's not a hard word. You can, everybody can say it. Um, but, but timing in the Hebrew mind wasn't just a kind of an understanding of what time of day is it. Uh, uh, you know, is it, is it you know, 25 to 11 or, or, or 10 past 12? That's, that's part of it. They want to know where they are in, in the overall chronology of the day. But timing in the Old Testament is, is understanding the appointed time. Uh, a time when God seizes the moment if you will, to do His will. And um, in the New Testament, this will be developed further uh, because uh, the, the Greek language, which is, is the language of the New Testament, has two different words for time. Uh, the word chronos, from which we get the word chronology, just the passing of the days, so to speak, and then kairos, the specific time, the appointed time, uh, God's time, if you will. Um, that isn't a New Testament understanding alone, but it is, it is actually an Old Testament understanding, and uh, uh, it comes easily into the New Testament. And there's other moments we won't go into uh, looking all of these up, but if you, if you wanted to look, for example, at Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, uh, the whole business of Noah building the ark, well, that all happens in God's time. Ezekiel chapter 22, the exile all happens in God's timing. And then that very famous poem uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a time for everything. And uh, that, that appointed time, a time for peace, a time for war, a time for uh, sowing, and a time for rending, and all of those sorts of things. And this is the concept that's behind that, that this is the moment uh, for such a time, an appointed time as this. All right, um, which leads then to the question, um, uh, and this is the part where in it would be probably good to be able to have some, some extended discussion of all of this, uh, but maybe you can ponder this in the weeks ahead and, and uh, correspond uh, with email if you want about uh, the timing. Why has God placed me exactly where I am right now? In our own lives, we often come to those sorts of moments where, okay, is it an accident that I'm here right now? Uh, no, you know, I, I've had any number of experiences over the years in my professional pastoral life, but, but also in my personal life where you realize, maybe not exactly in the moment that it's happening, because sometimes in the moment you're just sort of swept up in the events as they're happening around you, and you don't have time to kind of ponder the bigger uh, uh, picture that, that's going on, but where later you go, oh, wow, God put me there, and, and I wasn't there by accident. And uh, Jesus, in a sense, draws his disciples' uh, attention uh, to this when he's talking uh, with them about taking up the cross, that, uh, that, that this is, uh, uh, the, the, the time is, is, is always right to take up the cross and follow. 
Uh, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Uh, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and they will repay each person according to what he has done." And uh, the, again, the, the disciples are there to, you know, take up the cross. This is the appointed time, Jesus says, and, and to, in a sense, lose ourselves in what it is that we are uh, being called to do. Paul puts it another way, and I, I, I thought of this um, after I did the PowerPoint and never got time to go back to adjust it again, but Paul in his letter to Timothy talks about preaching the Word in season and out, you know, knowing when those times are, but also not being afraid to, to witness to our faith and to seize the moments that are there. Now, uh, all that said, um, you know, I, there have been probably many more moments where uh, I've looked back later and I've gone, oh, I had a great chance there and I blew it. Um, this happens, you know. I mean, we don't need to, you know, we shouldn't be beating ourselves up about that either. Um, we're, we, we don't, you know, in, the, we're in our humanity, we don't have perfect vision of everything. And sometimes, like the disciples, we get a little overtaken by fear and, and all of those sorts of things. And, you know, Peter's a great example. You know, he had the chance there in the courtyard to stand there with his Savior. And, nope, three times he, he found ways around that. And, and who's the, you know, Jesus goes to him, you know, in, in, after the resurrection to say, hey, you know, feed my sheep. Let's move on. Let's keep going forward. And that's what God does. He even takes, you know, as I said before, a moment of failure uh, to make us um, uh, 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 take, uh, I'm looking at, I have, one, I have a brain that can do one thing at a time and I should stop multitasking. I'm trying to read an email and talk at the same time. That never works for me. Absolutely never works for me. Just a comment back that how comforting it is that when we stumble in sin, uh, God is there uh, to, that, that we're reminding us that even though we fall, uh, we're, we're still worthy uh, by Christ, and, and absolutely, yeah, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here, too. All right, so what does Esther do? We'll just take just a quick minute. We're near the end of our time here, but uh, this part uh, goes pretty quickly here. Esther um, seizes the moment. Um, uh, she, for the first time in the story, becomes the active player. Up to now, she's been the passive one. Mordecai took her to the harem. Uh, the, the officials in the harem got her ready for the king. Uh, the king made his choice. She didn't choose him. He chose her. Um, and she didn't know about what was going on uh, in the kingdom until Mordecai tells her. Um, but to, to quote... Uh, um, Shakespeare, she, uh, you know, screws her courage to the sticking point, if you will, and decides that she is going before the king. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. And here fasting comes up again, and I would argue um, could just as easily be the word pray for me. Uh, because fasting and prayer were so intimately uh, woven together. Don't eat for three days, night or day, and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And with that, uh, we will bring our lesson to a close for today and, uh, and uh, go forward next time into the intrigue. Uh, we're going to find out that Esther... Uh, even though she's been passive up to this point in time, uh, when she gets to set together a plan, uh, she's, uh, she's a mastermind and uh, outfoxes the fox, if you will. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that uh, in spite of our failures, you keep using us. Help us to 
be aware, as Mordecai was, of the times in which we find ourselves, that we would uh, know uh, that, that you have placed us in positions at certain times for very specific reasons and give us courage, as you gave to Esther, to seize those moments, uh, for it is, in many times, for such a time as this, that you have placed us in certain situations. Bless us now and be with us as we worship you, uh, giving you all glory and honor and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, same time next week. God's blessings.